Okay, good morning or good afternoon to everybody that has joined us. Uh, there are people here from countries uh, from Chile all the way through to Europe, the Middle East and the North of Africa, and even people from New Zealand and Australia. So wherever you are, welcome. And um, we are here to discuss today what the opportunity of the electric vehicles is for the energy industry and how things are going to change uh, in the future. So with us here today, we have uh, four exceptional speakers or three exceptional speakers. That is Colin McCarriger from Bloomberg. We have Stephanie Legentil from uh, Clean Energy Business Council and Laurie Asalet from Engie. So each of them are going to give us a different perspective on the electric uh, vehicle opportunity and how you can use uh, this change in the trend and this new, um, new opportunity, if you like, for your own benefit and for the benefit of your company. So before we start with anything else and whilst more people come into the room, I would like to ask you a question. So if I can please have the polls online. So this is a question for you guys to answer so that we can get an understanding of who's in the room and how you are considering electric vehicles. Whether this is the first time for you to, um, to consider it or it's already part of your strat uh, strategy. So the question is very simple is, are you considering EVs as part of your forward strategy? Are you considering it as part of it or not? Is it something that has already been considered for a few years? Are you starting to think about it? I can see that a lot of people are voting already. And uh, the answer, it's uh, quite black and white, quite honestly. So I'm going to give you five more seconds to, to answer and to get your last answers in. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's see what we have. And we have an 85% of people that are saying, of the people that have answered, that are saying, yes, this is part of my strategy. And only 15% saying no. Can we have the second question as well? Thank you. Second question is, uh, what time frame are you considering EVs? Is it immediately two to three years, four to five years, or five plus years? Um, here we're trying to ascertain, you know, whether it's a reality for you already, it's part of your business model, it's something that you're uh, making investments on, or is it something that you're considering for, um, you know, a longer term opportunity, perhaps a purchase? Um, okay, there is not so much agreement here on this one. I'm going to give you five more seconds to get your, your answers in, and then we will allow them. So, five, four... Three, two, one, let's just say. Right, so most of the people are thinking two to three years. Some of the people are very large among 33% are staying immediately and the longer term people are actually the least. Um, very, very interesting, thank you very much. If we can close this. Okay, so now you know who is in the room, people interested, people already looking into it, people that are uh, investing in it already immediately on the shorter term. So without further ado, I'm going to let Stefan give us the introduction uh, to the Clean Energy Business Council and what you're doing in these terms, and then we will continue with the rest of the panelists. Stefan, if you're going to mute your, phone, your microphone and show us your screen, please. Yes. So I hope it works now. So good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending clearly. Thank you. on where you are. Um, I'm the um, CEO of the Clean Energy uh, Business Council for Middle East and North Africa. Um, uh, the Clean Energy Business Council, or the CBC, uh, it's a non-profit, uh, non-governmental association that brings together uh, local, um, sorry, I have one little thing to do, sorry. Um, sorry, a little problem. Okay. Uh, leading local and international organization in the MENA clean energy sector from both the private and uh, public spheres. What we do is we promote a constructive dialogue and collective action uh, by all the stakeholders uh, to guide public policies and private investment in the region uh, nation clean energy sector. Uh, we do provide um, to our members um, updates uh, on the latest developments in clean energy policy, uh, research and technology, and opportunities to grow their organizations to network with high-level industry players. 
Uh, if you're interested, uh, there's the website of the Clean Energy Business Council. You can register on our uh, mailing list. We send every month a newsletter that gives you a lot of information about what's happening in the MENA region, in the clean energy sector. We also do a lot of um, uh, networking events uh, and we organize events as well. Uh, so like this webinar uh, today in cooperation with uh, ATA Insights. We have one coming in August, mid-August, also with ATA Insights on uh, solar dispatchability. Uh, and then in September, we restart our event sessions. We have um, an event mid of September, uh, September that will be on clean energy finance. There's a lot to do there in the MENA region. So we start a series of events uh, related to clean energy uh, finance. You will get more information very soon. In October, we in fact organize uh, for Dubai Electricity and Water Authority the um, uh, Dubai so uh, Solar Show webinar uh, in cooperation with EWS uh, WWF, with the UNFCCC, and with the uh, Sustainable City. Um, and there are many more events that, that will be coming. Uh, we, are, we have today uh, a bit more than 100 members uh, within the Clean Energy Business Council and we are located uh, in the UAE, um, registered in Mazdar City. Um, so for today, one thing that uh, is important is that we have a very special announcement uh, to make uh, as the Clean Energy Business Council that I think will be of interest to many of you uh, in the MENA region, is we create the uh, CBC New Energy Vehicles Club. There is a lot of interest right now uh, in, the, in the Middle East, uh, and particularly starting a lot in the UAE for, for um, electric vehicles, but also other type of uh, energies. So we called it the New Energy Vehicles Club. Our objective and the objective of the club is, is really to represent the industry and speak as one voice to the different authorities, uh, to lobby for specific requirements with the local authorities and to fac facilitate the market uh, development for those vehicles. Also to organize uh, interactions with the local authorities and work really uh, close to them, hand in hand with them to raise awareness and educate the public through workshops and conferences. So you will hear more the CBC in getting involved in a lot more into uh, electric vehicles events and to share also information through networking, uh, regulation, understanding of the requirements. And obviously for our members, which is very important, is to contribute to open new markets uh, for the members of the club. So uh, a lot more details will be coming very soon. Uh, so stay tuned, uh, you, you'll get those uh, information uh, very soon on, as how to join the club and uh, what we'll be doing. That's uh, the introduction I wanted to make. Um, so thank you, Belen, I give the mic back to you. Thank you, Stefan. It's good to know that we're already making you know, strides in terms of getting the discussion going because this is going to be a huge disruption for the energy industry. Can you stop sharing your screen? And Colin, I'm going to give you the... Um, just uh, unmute your, your, um, your microphone and share your screen. And I think it's important to recognize, I think, the significance of, of this disruption. I think it's just as large as the renewable energy disruption was at the time. So we're going to hear now from Colin about the kind of a bit more of the larger, um, the larger scale, if you like, the larger picture. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you, Belen. And, and thanks to everyone for being on the line today. So my name is Colin McCarricker, <clears throat> and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the data that my team gathers on kind of where the global EV market is going. Um, so just a little bit of background on, on sort of who, who I am and who, where, where I'm coming from in this. Uh, I manage a, a group called the Advanced Transport Team within Bloomberg New Energy Finance. So we're the research uh, division of uh, Bloomberg, which many of you may know from the TV channel or the financial services firm. Uh, we look at quite a range of technologies. Uh, the company had its original start in things like wind and solar and carbon markets, but now increasingly looking a lot at things like energy storage, electric vehicles, 
um, and a newer service called Frontier Power where we're looking at things like off-grid. But the main thing is we gather a lot of data on all these markets and what's going on. So without further ado, let me talk a little bit about what's going on in electric vehicles and where we see it going. So electric vehicle sales have been rising very quickly lately. This will probably be no surprise to many of you. That's kind of why we're on the call. Generally, growth rates of sort of 40 to 60 percent over the last few years. So in 2013, you have just over 200,000 EVs sold globally. Um, this year, we're forecasting about a million. That's plug-in hybrids and pure battery electrics combined. Um, and that does not include things like buses. So that's passenger vehicles only. And what you see in the last, really in the last two years, is this really start to spread beyond kind of a US story um, to really being a, a global one. So China pushing very hard on this and uh, sales growing very quickly in Europe as well. And you can see that just here. This is These are the countries where EVs are above 1% of total passenger vehicle sales. So a few years ago, you really just have the Netherlands, Sweden, and Norway. And now just in Q1 of 2017, you have quite a few countries now above this sort of, sort of symbolic 1% threshold. Still a very small share of the overall vehicle market, but growing very quickly. And you see some of the bigger markets like the US, uh, like China, and like Germany joining that group in kind of the 1% club. Um, and also what's happening, of course, is the number of electric models that's starting to hit the market is growing really fast. So this is just pure electrics going out to 2020. Um, but what you're seeing is that more vehicles coming in that fit all the different vehicle classes. So rather than being con confined to a few uh, small vehicle classes, you're starting to see much more electric models hitting things like SUVs, um, sedans, and many of them with a very high range. So on the x-axis, that's uh, the range in miles. So some of the vehicles that are going to be launching uh, in the next few years have kind of 300 miles of range or, or targeting that anyway. So five, 600 kilometers of range from some of the vehicles that are coming out. Uh, even the ones today that are that are launching this year sort of in the low 200 miles of range, 350 odd kilometers. Um, there's really two main, main things if you want to reduce it to, to two big drivers for why this is happening. One of them is fuel economy regulations. So this chart actually shows we've normalized the different fuel economy regulations in the EU and the US and China onto the same sort of metric, but um, they're actually measured differently and, and, and the targets are expressed differently, but you can think of them as similar. Basically, fuel economy regulations are, have been getting tighter and are projected to get a lot lot tighter over the next few years. And that's not a forecast that's based on things like the US corporate average fuel economy targets, the Chinese and European CO2 targets. Now the US CAFE target uh, is, is a little bit in doubt under the Trump administration. It will probably get relaxed, but certainly the other two big auto markets in the world, uh, Europe and China are pushing very hard to make their vehicles much more efficient. And it gets really difficult to meet these fuel economy regulations without EVs being a significant share of of sales. And that's really a big part of why you see the car companies moving. It's not necessarily to try and catch these kind of one or two or 3% of early adopters. It's because you have to in order to meet fuel economy regulations. Uh, and and the, the penalties in those case, in some of those cases can be quite high for not meeting those regulations. Uh, we did some work looking at the EU's and target of, or potential target of 78 grams of CO2 uh, per kilometer driven as a fleet-wide average and concluded that you'd need somewhere between 10 and 17 percent of all vehicle sales to be electric by 2025, um, depending on the mix of plug-in hybrids and battery electrics. So again, fuel economy regulations are a big part of this. China is, uh, is a really big part of this. Um, so in addition to China's fuel economy regulations, their most recent uh, auto 2025 plan states that all new vehicle sales growth should come from electrics. So they want the internal combustion engine vehicle market to flatline and all growth between now and 2025 to come from electric. So in 2025, you're looking at around 20% uh, of sales. Uh, so that's pretty significant out of China. The other big trend that's really driving this is battery costs. So each year we survey the, the market for EV lithium ion battery uh, prices. Uh, we in interview both buyers and sellers, gather quite a few different data points. We've been doing that all the way back since 2010. Since then, prices have come down 73% over six years, so really dramatic drops. And this is um, the combined pack and sell costs. So some of you may have seen lower numbers from, say, um, GM saying, look, we're already at $146, or um, Audi saying we're, we're approaching being able to buy sometime soon at around 100 euros a kilowatt hour. 
Uh, that's generally cell only cost. So these include cells and packs, and it's an average of plug-in hybrids and pure battery electrics. So the plug-in hybrid packs generally tend to be more. And then there's also a bit of a lag because we do that th this at the end of each year. So already the, the numbers will be significantly lower than this for 2017. So really that's that's a big part of where that's, uh, where the, uh, of the drive behind why you're seeing more movement into electric vehicles and more kind of interest in it broadly. I won't go too far into this one, but this, this green area in there actually just highlights, there's actually a fair bit of range depending on the survey respondents we talked to about our battery price index. Um, and on the bottom is the, uh, the total volume of batteries going into vehicles around the world. And what we're able to do when we have that information is figure out roughly what the learning rate is, the relationship between volume and cost reduction in batteries. And from what we can gather so far, the learning rate is some, somewhere around 19%. That's not as high as something like solar, where it's around 20, somewhere between 26 and 28%, but it is pretty high and it is also still uh, going to lead to very significant cost reduction. So that learning rate is essentially, you can think of it as the cost reduction for every cumulative doubling of manufactured volume of something. So it's a good way to understand how disruptive an industry is going to be and how fast things will move. The other big thing that's going on in batteries is not just density. There is not just cost, it's also density. So density has been improving on a watt hour per kilogram basis over the last few years. So you're getting uh, more energy density out of the batteries at a lower cost. Those two are related because you're using less materials in order to uh, get the same number of kilowatt hours and that's cutting both weight um, and, and cost out of them. Uh, we do a fair bit of work forecasting where we think this goes over the next few years. Um, and, and really the important thing to recognize in, in this is that sometime around 2025, you get an upfront cost um, parity crossover across most vehicle classes sometime between 2025 and 2029 with the automaker still making a comparable margin. So that's important. Right now, most automakers don't uh, make much money, if any, on selling electric vehicles. Battery prices need to come down more in order for them to sell a comparable vehicle to their, an ICE counterpart and make a profit. Um, so we build a bottom-up cost model of not only the batteries, but also the economics of the vehicles themselves to determine where we think this crossover is coming. Now, some automakers can hit that sooner. Um, some luxury segments will also hit that sooner, but most of the major uh, segments start to cross over around 2025, sometime between 2025 and 2029. 20, uh, That's actually not that far away in auto terms um, when you think of sort of a, a product with a, a product development cycle of sort of four or five, six years. Uh, that's actually fairly close. So that's why you see a lot of the increased announcements from the major car companies. We also look at where we think this is going. So we do a very detailed forecasting uh, exercise every year. Um, EV sales are about 1% right now in most markets, as I said before, so still pretty small. Um, we foresee that growing pretty dramatically in the next few years, going up to about 5% in Europe and 3 or 4% uh, in Europe or in, in the US and China. The rest of the world will be a bit slower. But so that's pretty dramatic growth. But in our models, the real takeoff happens more around 2025. Uh, and again, that's because of this unsubsidized total cost of ownership and upfront uh, cost parity crossover that we're forecasting to happen across major vehicle classes in the major vehicle markets. So then we expect it to go quite quickly and quickly rise from there. So EV sales will still probably only be about 3% of global car sales in 2020, maybe 4%. Um, and then it really starts to pick up around 2025. The big thing to remember is that the vehicle fleet uh, takes a long time to move. There's about a billion cars on the road. So penetration in total vehicles will actually still be less than this. Um, and actually the way we think of this when we model it is that we often, uh, part of what we do is we apply kind of an infrastructure cap. So we still think there will be some difficult uh, to address markets. So really high density urban dwellers um, where there's very limited charging infrastructure options, we still think inhibits the growth rate and that's why you don't see it kind of go even faster than that. But even then we are forecasting that um, by 2040, more than half the vehicles sold in the world uh, are electric and the vast majority of those we're forecasting to be pure battery electrics because they really start to win on cost uh, due to that battery cost curve that I talked about. But this is not inevitable. So we think this is very likely uh, we're very optimistic on EV sales, but it is not inevitable. So we flagged a few of the things that could derail it. Um, big policy changes in the US, China, or the EU. Right now, EV market is still dependent on subsidies and supportive policies. If all that comes out in a few big markets, that could have a big impact. Lithium ion battery prices slowing down would also have a big impact. Um, mass market interest is still relatively uncertain. We're only in a few markets where we've gotten past the really early adopters. So it's important to note that that is still a big element of uncertainty. There is a possibility that consumers 
don't like the, some of the behavioral changes needed in order to do uh, to, to cope with charging. Uh, we still think that gets overcome, but it's it's one to watch. Um, there's a few other on there, a few other ones on there um, that we think could could have an impact. But really, the biggest ones are slowdown in lithium-ion battery price declines or policy changes in the U.S. and then this mass market question. I'll leave you with one thought here. And when we're talking about energy market impacts of electric vehicles, the key is actually to think small, not big. So we often think of these big vehicles um, starting at the top and moving down. So whether that's a Tesla Model S or a Mitsubishi Outlander we've shown here. If you wanna think about the energy market impacts of electric vehicles, it actually helps to think about the smaller vehicles. And this is a, a low speed EV in China. Um, these are generally uh, unregulated and unsubsidized and growing very, very quickly. So there's some data there just on Shandong province in China where over 600,000 of these were sold last year. Those don't make it into the global passenger vehicles um, forecast or the global passenger vehicles data because they're not capable of highway speeds. They're essentially uh, low speed vehicles in, um, in, in smaller cities in China, but they're growing really fast. And kind of one of the biggest questions to ask around how much this is gonna impact the energy sector is whether you start to see these vehicles pop up in other cities, other emerging economies. So do you see them on the streets of Bangkok? Do you see them on the streets of Delhi or Manila? And of course, India has a very ambitious goal around EVs accounting for all new vehicle sales uh, from 2030 onwards. So far, we don't think that's very realistic given how much, given some of the major hurdles that are in place for that. But we do think they're gonna make very big progress on things like uh, two wheelers and uh, rickshaws. So uh, that's kind of, the, the, the point I'll leave you with is when you're thinking about the energy market impacts, think about some of these smaller things, because if it happens from the bottom at the same time as happening from the top, then this could all go a lot faster. So with that, I will hand over back to Belen. Thanks. Thank you very much, Colin. Very interesting. Um, things are moving a lot in China and India um, at the very same time. Uh, so yeah, definitely there is this double approach. No, what about, let's hear about NG side and then we can go back a little bit of some of the issues that Colin has raised. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, just trying to get hold of it. So I'm uh, working for NG. Uh, we are a French uh, energy company. Um, and we've been working actually here uh, in Europe, but also in the Middle East in trying to start uh, green mobility. Um, and for us, it's quite a big word. So today we talk about EV, but because we are an energy company, we've been working in the gas business, in the electricity business, and we have come to the realization that today the car um, manufacturing industry is going through some kind of revolution that is driven by users, that is driven by um, new business model that is driven by environmental concerns and that this industry is currently in evolving through different uh, streams. So we see more and more um, CNG, uh, NGV uh, transportation, so powered by gas. Uh, we see some of the manufacturers that are working on hydrogen and we see uh, the emergence of the electric vehicle market. Um, which for us is quite interesting because it's another way of uh, building electricity network. Um, so just a rapid uh, description of NG. So uh, we have been, we are quite an old company. We have been active in power, in uh, natural gas in, and in energy services. And this is quite interesting because today as a company, we see the need to move to the transportation sector where all those three uh, dynamics are uh, happening in one place, uh, in the car market. So if I go very rapidly to what we've been doing in Dubai and, and a bit how we position ourselves. So uh, the UAE is quite, uh, uh, I would say, emerging in terms of um, EV cars. We have seen that Dubai is, is taking the lead. They have been uh, doing some tenders. They have announced some subsidy program. Uh, they, they are trying to put it at the center uh, of their energy strategy at the moment and they invite companies like ours to really uh, uh, position themselves as uh, a charging station in, uh, infrastructure provider or as a car manufacturer. And when you look at the market, you've seen Renault that is taking some uh, early market share by providing government with the first electric vehicle fleets. 
Um, and you've seen Tesla that is now entering the market and should open their first uh, electric vehicle showroom uh, and, and technical uh, center in a in couple of weeks. Um, company like ours, uh, like uh, working more in the infrastructure uh, sector, have come and today are providing, uh, they are trying to launch uh, networks in the UAE. What is quite interesting is um, we are really, as a charging station provider, at the first stage of what, of what could be done. Um, and what I would like to try to show you um, is that the EV market, from an infrastructure point of view, is much more bigger than a simple box. And what we are really doing at the moment is really creating a new way of providing power at customer premises um, and at uh, business premises. So I just have a short promotional video that talk about EV Box, which is our brand, but which show to you how everything in, is linked. So the charging station, decentralized energy, the fact that it's not simply a box, but it allows you to, to have a smart grid uh, mechanism um, and, and to control the power in a better way, which I think is quite important. So I'll try to start it up. Yes. We all know it's happening. The market for electric vehicles is growing exponentially. There are already more than a million electric vehicles on the road, and the growth isn't going to stop. Soon, everyone owns a stunning EV, charging it at home, at work, or on the go. This will have a huge impact on the energy transition, and it will create new business possibilities. To keep up with this market, you need to manage and control these charging stations. At EV Box, we want people to drive electric and charge everywhere. We already manage more stations than anyone else, and we aim to expand our reach. We have the most innovative range of charging solutions. Our stations are connected online and integrate with more and more solar, home, and battery storage devices. All to ensure you can balance the station's output, depending on the available energy and of course, for management and maintenance. There are currently more than 45,000 EV box charging points, and our product is licensed and already in use in 24 countries. Looks like a bright future, right? But we want more. Together, we can accelerate the rollout of stations and new business models. So let's connect our businesses and grow together. EV box, drive. Oops. Okay, uh, so I think what is quite interesting is what we saw in this video, the fact that a charging station goes very well with a rooftop solar, goes very well with being independent from the grid, goes very well with sophisticated energy markets. So time of use tariff, for instance, where maybe it's cheaper to charge at, at night, where you have incentive for it, and incentive as well that allow individuals or company to have a more direct uh, management of their electricity. And when you look at what is happening right now in the UAE, you see that it's actually coming to that. Uh, if you look at Dubai, Dubai uh, integrate actually their EV policy within a broader uh, energy strategy. So the rooftop solar, for instance, um, we know that energy, uh, um, sorry, Time of use tariff is also part, is one of the, the energy pillar strategy. That is something that could come at some point. Um, and empowering customer is also something that is coming. So what is quite interesting is, is to realize that EV uh, business and, and infrastructure is extremely linked to the level of maturity of the electricity market uh, of one country. And I think this is very important. And this is why, as NG, we're actually quite excited about it. Now, I want to show you a, a case study. Um, so we are working uh, at the moment for the municipality of Rotterdam. Um, and what is quite interesting is, if I compare it again to the UAE, Rotterdam uh, and the Netherlands are quite advanced. And even in terms of their business model. So often we are asked as an as a infrastructure provider, Oh, but how do you take a business decision? Are you waiting to have a lot of um, EV providers that are coming? Or are you putting first infrastructure? And if you talk to a car manufacturer, they're going to tell you the same. Uh, we believe that it has to go hands in hands. And we have 
to start putting infrastructure at the same time as we have the first car manufacturers coming. Now, if I look at Dubai, the way we are, the business model at the moment is very simple. We are just an uh, equipment provider somehow. But if you looked at European markets, um, this is much more sophisticated. And in the case of uh, Rotterdam, the municipality has chosen to work um, through a concession uh, business model. So I'll just show you a very rapid video and then go a bit more into the, the case study. So uh, it all started with really having uh, Rotterdam municipality taking a bold decision that is based on their commitment to environment, their, their need and desire to reduce noise and pollution, and they decided to have 25% of their municipal fleet being EVs. So far, if you look again at the UAE, uh, it's pretty the same, it's pretty much the same. The UAE has made such a commitment. Um, they have then set quite an ambitious target to have uh, 200,000 e vehicles uh, on the roads by 2020. And if you go actually to cities like Amsterdam, most of the taxis today are actually EVs. The way they have made it um, uh, marketable and possible is they have invited um, charging station providers like us uh, for a tender in which the business model has been that they grant concession on where to put the charging points against a fee. So we are paying actually the municipality, which give the municipality uh, some kind of revenue, an incentive. Um, and, and the idea was to roll as much as charging point as possible. So they have done it in two phases, uh, one that was uh, commissioned two years ago, and now they are again renewing the concession. The idea once those charging points were made available is really to grant uh, uh, the provider, the charging station provider, quite a strong grip uh, on, on, on the network and, and not only to install and maintain it, but also to uh, work out uh, smartly electricity and the sales of electricity, uh, which is also very interesting in our case because at the end of the day, we also have to, to make money. Uh, and it creates uh, really an additional uh, stream of revenue uh, with the sale of electricity. Um, now, what is, uh, and, and that's also a law, uh, something quite interesting in terms of financing, which I think is quite key, uh, because the rollout of electric vehicle, even if it has to be national or even regional, if you look at uh, fast charging corridors, that are being put in uh, Europe, for instance, this is really regional, it also has to be viable. And most often, uh, the cost is uh, it's the municipality which has to bear it. Um, so you have to work out quite an ingenious financial way that is, it is uh, interesting for the municipality to, to engage in such a stream, but also realistic for companies like NG to as well try to participate. Um, and, and so I think the Rotterdam example is quite interesting. Now, uh, I will not go into more case studies, but even from a private sector point of view, such type of schemes are applied. Um, again, I take the example of the Netherlands. We work a lot with uh, business, so really B2B type of company that decide to lease uh, electric vehicles to their employees but then want to be sure that, uh, again, um, they provide it at, at uh, interesting cost for themselves. Uh, they, are not have, they, they don't have to bear a massive electricity bill. And, and they ask us really to provide a package 
that is realistic for them, where the electricity is managed, where this is saved, where it is operated in a smart way. And this is where a charging station at the end are not just a box. Uh, they are much more sophisticated than this. And we managed to um, uh, work out a network of charging station that are operated smartly, that take into account um, electricity price variation, um, that, that charge smartly in the sense that you will not have a massive load put on parking, for instance. Um, and, and so this is something we try to bring to Dubai. Uh, what I really like uh, about the initiative of the, of the CBC, and I, I will un, end on, on, that, uh, on, on that note, um, is the fact that in Dubai the, and Abu Dhabi and Sharjah, um, there is a lot of excitement about the EV market. And this is good. This is the place where we can really test it. At the same time, we really need to work together as an ecosystem, so just not infrastructure provider on, on, on one hand and the car on the other hand and maybe the authority on, on, on again, another side. Because to make it happen, we need to uh, allow or to put together so many variables to make it work that it makes complete sense to sit together in an EV club and start to discuss how do we make it mass market? How do we make our buildings, for instance, um, strong enough or, or how do we put in place a charging station network smart enough that we don't disrupt the full electricity of a building? Um, all these kind of questions, I think, are very relevant for Dubai. And this is what we would like to bring from our European experience. So thanks. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Laura. OK. So um, I am aware, <clears throat> I'm going to give you also a little bit of a presentation about sort of current affairs, what's going on. But I know that Colin, unfortunately, needs to leave us very shortly. So we have just a couple of minutes. So I wanted to ask, uh, Colin, there's a few questions here that I think you're in the best position to answer before you go. So one says, uh, how does the US pulling out of the Paris Agreement affect the future of EVs? Um, I don't know if you care to comment about that. There's also sure. one about tightening of the fuel economy laws. Sure. So, I mean, I'll just say on our any of our forecasting exercises we do, we don't assume any explicit climate targets. So we're not assuming that uh, anybody's Paris target gets met or, or that there are increasingly more binding global emissions um, constraints or anything like that. So I, I think the, the pulling out of the Paris Accord does not immediately affect things. I think if that's a signal that the US administration is going to do much more to relax the domestic policies that do exist, like CAFE, um, or to potentially go after California's ability to set its own rules, which would be quite a, a court battle. Um, but then that could be a, a that, that could set the US EV market back significantly. But uh, as to the Paris Accord specifically, I, I, I look, I think uh, a strongly enforced Paris Agreement would definitely be a boost for EVs. But in terms of the base case that we're forecasting and the numbers that I discussed, it is not dependent on anything to do with the, the Paris Accord. So um, I don't think that uh, has an immediate impact on, on the numbers, though I suppose if it is implemented, there is some upside beyond that. And in terms of uh, the fuel economy, you mentioned, um, you know, that the fuel economy laws are one of the key drivers. What other governmental policies and regulations dictate sales and use of EVs? Yeah, so you can think of it really broadly that the, the, the fuel economy regulations are why the car companies feel they have to have models and things like ZEV mandates. So California's ZEV mandate uh, plays a very big role in, in forcing the automakers to bring vehicles to market. Now, those vehicles can just be what's called compliance cars. They're not actually uh, backed up by a major sales effort. So they sell the exact number of them that they need to in order to meet the ZEV mandate. Um, so that also plays a role. Uh, the purchase subsidies play a role generally right now where there are no purchase subsidies, there are no EV sales um, or almost that's not 100 percent true, but it's very close. So the, the cost is still too high and they do. That is that is a problem. Uh, otherwise, um, the price of charging an EV compared to fuel charges. So, like, is it much, much cheaper to actually run an EV than running a, an oil based a combustion engine vehicle? I yeah, think generally, I mean, gen where. yeah, go ahead, Colin. I think the question is where. In some places, it's more interesting. In others, less so. Okay. 
All right, so just one final question before you go, Colin. Um, is there any move to standardize uh, electric vehicles in terms of the charging side of things? There are various pushes underway. I, I don't, I'm not very optimistic, to be honest, on full standardization on the physical connectors for, for charger charging infrastructure. I think it will remain a bit um, segmented for a while. Uh, you have essentially four standards uh, for fast charging anyway. You have the Chatamo standard backed by the Japanese companies, the CCS standard backed by most of the European ones. Uh, the Tesla supercharger standard, and also uh, the uh, the Chinese one that's that's uh, just being that's being developed um, in Europe. I think you will see the CCS standard really start to pull ahead now that the European automakers are getting behind it. But in terms of globally, the picture on on charging infrastructure will remain fragmented for a while. Well, thank you very much. We'll let you go. Uh, thank you very much for your for your help. And uh, if you don't mind. Um, just I'm just going to move to my presentation now was you know Colin has to leave unfortunately and then we'll take it up again so we can ask as many questions as you like to Stefan and Love so Colin thank you very much and we hope to see you soon again in another event thank you a real pleasure and thanks Stefan let me just uh, really quickly show you what I was thinking and uh, fortunately Colin is no longer here but before I he went I actually asked him a question and um, my, my thing here is like uh, so that you know where I come from. I'm a company that looks at, uh, I've already, Stefan spoke to us a little bit and I wanted to give you my perspective. We look uh, into markets and um, we are essentially a company, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this, but we do business intelligence, marketing and communications. And the question for me for calling earlier and my fellow panelists heard it, it was before the event started, was what percentage of cars are electric now? And the answer from calling was 0.2%. That's how much, the amount of cars that are there in the street now. But I have a question. How many cars or what percentage of cars were electric in the 1900s? And I'd like to ask Stefan and Laura to give their opinion. How many, what percentage do you think were electric in the 1900s? Stefan? Mm, good question. I think probably higher than today, no? Yeah, but I mean, give a number. Mm, 5%? All right. Laura, what did you think? Okay, I go higher, I'll say 10. All right, well, yes, this is the answer. It's incredible when you think about it. Actually, 34% of our vehicles were electric in the 1900s. And um, it's easy to think, you know, what happened there, you know, was actually 34% of cars in New York, Boston, and Chicago were electric motors, and ne nearly half of those had steam engines. And what happened is business model happened. Uh, the electric car company decided that, you know, people didn't have the know-how to maintain a car, so they would... Uh, rent the cars. What they failed to realize is that actually people wanted to own the cars because it was something that made them feel good about themselves. You know, it was the whole um, status. They failed to see this, which meant that in uh, very quickly they went bankrupt and everybody that had invested in, in, in the EV technology decided to, but lost a lot of money, and decided to never do that again. So it's quite interesting how actually the reason why we have combustion engines today is because of a business mobile decision, not a technology decision. In fact, combustion engine cars were more expensive, they were more difficult to, to maintain. They, they had a lot of things working against them, but it was the fact that you could own them what made people want or prefer them. Um, so what does this mean for us? Well, you know, there's a change in habits going on and there's a bunch of things coming together. You know, they're not so easy as, okay, this is what's happening in the market. We have to look at how people consume, how governments are changing the pace. So Norway, for example, announced that they're not going to be, you're not going to be able to buy any more combustion engine cars in 2025 there. Um, but India, also by 2030. And actually, already auto rickshaws are running in, on batteries that are swappable. And France, I mean, I'm sure you've seen this, they've decided that 2040 is the date for them. And Volvo has decided that either electric or hybrid for them only from uh, 2019. So you're thinking that this is something that is going to happen slowly? I, I really think that you need to be thinking more of the 1900s and what happened to electric cars. Um, BMW and pg and &E are already proving how electric vehicles can be a great resource. They've run a number of tests, and this is like through the board, by the way. Um, vehicles are essentially batteries, and they can move where they're needed. Um, yes, there is an infrastructure that needs to be built, you know, but net metering is possible with vehicles. Um, Already there are vehicles that are charging quicker. You know, there are solar vehicles that already have, have actually been able to uh, create their own energy as they go. So this is changing. The technology is changing. The business models are changing. Um, and these are all 
really from the news. You know, I've only really put in Google, you know, latest news and this come up. And then we have something else coming into this. This is kind of the merging of two technologies. And it's the fact that um, there are cars that are now autonomous or self-driven, and these are going to grow. And uh, the sharing economy is making it much more interesting for this vehicles to be uh, self-driven. Lyft is one of the biggest taxi companies in the world, and they're looking into how their cars will be self-driven and also will be renewable energy, which essentially means for renewable energy people that the market is about to get much larger very, very quickly. So really, like if you look at the market, a large, and I know that this is very generic, you know, it's very high level and you need to really look how to apply this to your business and it's not easy. Um, but EVs are the biggest disruption since renewable energy. Renewable energy changed everything because uh, it's um, managed to localize the generation of energy. It, it, it makes it right now cheaper, but also less reliant on the international um, trade of energy. Um, it also increases the electricity market significantly. One that belonged earlier to the oil market, like a different type of market, is now really like it's allowing the pool to get larger, essentially. Therefore, it changes the geopolitics of oil. Uh, and there is a clear move towards decentralized grids because when you have batteries going around, then you know, and you're charging vehicles in different places, then the, 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 the way that the energy is consumed changes a lot. And then you have a lot of moving batteries, which is making it possible or necessary for us to think of the Internet of Things, which when we apply to energy is the Internet of Energy. And what this means is there is a need for a lot of software to be developed. Um, the sharing economy and self-driven cars kind of comes into this at the same time and emerges together. And finally, you have their big data coming in. Why is big data important? Because the whole thing is going to be made up of a lot of different things happening at the same time and somebody has to put sort of like um, you know, interest and uh, sense into it. So for me, I think that whether you're a developer, an EPC, um, uh, an utility, it doesn't really matter. There is lots of opportunities that you need to be thinking, lots of partnerships to be, lots of experimentation, because we don't know what the business model is. The same way that the electric vehicle company in 1900 didn't know what the business model is. But electric vehicles are here to stay. Ha habits are changing, and the numbers, although they're small, they'll become large really, really quickly. So I'm, I, for one, I'm very, very interested because uh, for me, this is like the second disruption that we have in energy in the past sort of couple of decades. And I think this is a huge opportunity for people to establish themselves. The question really now is what's the business model? So this was it for me. And let's have the questions that people have out there for you guys. Uh, Laura, you have quite a few here, actually. It's all about what you're doing in terms of standardizing uh, for electric vehicles, for example. Are you doing any moves on that? Yeah, so I think there are two points in this. First one is, um, so you, as, as uh, Colin was mentioning, there are a couple of standards that have been put in place. Uh, EV Box is produced in the Netherlands, so we comply with the European standards, which now starts to be actually quite strong. Um, now, if you go back to the UAE, um, Abu Dhabi uh, State um, Emirates uh, is launching through uh, the QCC, so that's, that's the quality um, and, uh, and, and standard organization, um, and, and is requesting uh, charging station manufacturers to uh, comply uh, with uh, standards that they are putting in place. Uh, so they have launched that very recently, I think it's about two weeks ago. And now, if you want to be able to participate to tenders uh, or even to put charging station uh, in Abu Dhabi, you will have to get certified uh, by, by this uh, governmental organization. Uh, they are using uh, European standards as well, uh, which I think is quite, uh, it's quite good. Um, and, and so, I mean, th that, that's what is going on. Now, as a, as a big uh, manufacturers, I mean, we have installed uh, more than uh, 40,000 uh, charging points. Um, we are working, you know, with EU bodies and, and we are as advanced as the, as the certification, I mean, as the standards are progressing. Um, what the participants need to know is, is a lot has to do actually with um, IT and communication systems because this is really what is behind the, the box, I would say. So a lot of it has to do with that and has to do as well with connectors. 
Uh, and today our charging station, they can take all the connectors uh, existing for cars. But most of them are like this, I would say, most of them. Okay, there is a, a few questions here, Laura, that I hope that you can answer about hydrogen. You know, a lot of people are worried, like, what, what, you know, how does hydrogen come in? Uh, does this matter? I don't know if you care or you've done yeah. any research into... So, yeah, for sure. So, a um, couple of things. So, at NG, we strongly believe in hydrogen. Uh, this is, uh, we, we have put a high priority on it uh, from a um, research and development perspective. So as an energy company, we see, we see it as very, very interesting because we believe uh, it's going to be one of the, of the elements that's really going to change the way uh, we work with energy, not only for cars, but, but also uh, more, um, I mean, more, more globally. Uh, so, so that's one point. Now, uh, if we go back to cars, you have uh, car manufacturers like Toyota, for instance, which is as well really working on it and really trying to develop uh, hydrogen cars. To my knowledge, um, today this is not yet commercially viable. You really have to think that already EV cars are still very expensive, so hydrogen cars are even more expensive. Uh, but this is something we see the market going that way. Uh, now the question is going to be, okay, if we manage to get electric cars, at some point, is it going to be replaced by hydrogen cars? Today, I don't know. Maybe maybe it will be replaced or maybe the two will coexist. Um, I don't know. How long does it take to charge an EV? There is a very specific question, I know, but somebody's asked it here and I thought, you know, it's a good point because you have the charging stations. You must be familiar with that. Yeah. So today, charging EVs, it depends on many parameters. So charging station, you have had different... Um, uh, I would say series of, char of charging station, and I'm sure all our participants have heard about the fast charging or the super fast charging station. Um, so, for instance, the super fast can charge between 30 minutes, 45 minutes to one hour, or even less, like some can do 15 minutes. Um, and and the, I would say a first generation of charging station, uh, you had to really put it at home, and it would take, you know, maybe six hours. So it really depends on, on the type of charging station you are using. And I would say, does it really matter? Because if you think about it, uh, think about it as for your, for your phone, your iPhone. Um, when do you charge it? Most of us will charge it at night. Uh, you will go home, plug your, your iPhone, and maybe go to sleep or have dinner, and you will let it charge. And you can imagine that, um, uh, residential users, so like you, me, uh, the participants, when they will have their EV cars, they will come back um, at home uh, at night, put it in their garage, plug it in, and we really don't care whether it takes 30 minutes or six hours, because they will be at home, they will go to sleep, and in the morning they will take their, their car, and they want the car to be charged at that point. So I would say that those charging stations, even if it still takes a lot of time, they still have a strong positioning in the overall ecosystem of charging. Now you will have other scenario where you have been driving for a long time, you're on the highway, and you realize that, oh, you need a top up. So this is, and, and you want maybe to stop as well, just have, have a break. So this is where the fast charging station will be really, really useful because you will stop somewhere, maybe go to the toilet, buy a snack, and you don't want to wait two hours. You want to have it like 15 minutes. So this is where they are very useful. Or you will go to work uh, or to the mall, do your shopping, and you will just want a top up. So this is where the second and third generation of charging station that maybe, you know, charge in one hour uh, will be really useful as well. So I think th this is what is happening. Now uh, the battery of the car are as well evolving. And some um, are, I would say, more fast to charge as well. So we will see that progress as we get along the way. So it's a bit of um, a weird, weird answer I'm giving, but yeah. Is, is there, a, is there a, a point or a business model or something that may fit with the swapping batteries rather than charging them? Swapping batteries, oh. Um, so this, to be honest, I'm, I'm not really sure because I'm not sure how it is easy to swap batteries uh, from your car because that's, that's kind of the master, uh, 
I mean, that's the masterpiece of the car. Now there is a real uh, need uh, to understand how we are going to uh, recycle um, batteries uh, that, that have been used to a point that they are not relevant anymore for the car. Uh, I know in Dubai that, for instance, uh, Sustainable City, uh, which is this uh, real estate development that, that, that's tried to be as, uh, as sustainable as positive, they are trying uh, to address this constraint uh, today because they, they ask us those questions, for instance. Um, and, and, and I know that there are a couple of providers worldwide that address as well the way they can uh, reuse batteries at some point. Um, but for the swap, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. And a final question to the two of you, because unfortunately we've nearly run out of time. Um, and this is for you as well, Stefan. There's two different questions here that I'd like to combine into one. One says, what are the most viable business models for EVs in your opinion? And the other one is more about from the network perspective, you know, then guessing that, you know, an EV being plugged in as long as possible is good because, you know, they can withdraw and add energy if and when required. Um, so that would be a preference. So it just these two comments, you know, what are the business models that you see more promising? And second, you know, what is more interesting to the grid and how can EVs help the grid? Yeah, so I think, I think um, that's a very, very good question. The impact of the uh, cars on the grid and the uh, law mentioned it. Uh, and it's, it's really uh, key that the uh, charging station uh, are, uh, are smart because they, if everybody comes home around seven in the evening and plug the car, you can imagine the load suddenly coming on the network. Uh, so there will be a lot of uh, uh, things that will need to be done to, to better manage the, the load uh, from the EV going forward as the, gr the growth will come uh, in the market. So I think that's, that's a pretty key question. And that's also why the utilities, the providers of electricity are, are really, really uh, involved into, into this because if not managed, it could, it could completely destroy their, you know, their grid uh, balancing and all these kind of things. So that's, that's a very, very important question. If I can add on that, uh, at the moment, you even see partnership of car, manufac uh, car manufacturers, like uh, I think it's Renault in Europe, and some fast charger manufacturers, um, EVtronics, for instance. Uh, and they are even working to the next step, which is how the car in itself, through the charging station, can become some kind of mini power plant and feed back into the grid. Uh, and this is very interesting because that uh, touched the topic of demand response. Um, at some point, buildings, cars, they, they, are, uh, they can become somehow producer of electricity and they can help the grids when you have those peak, uh, electricity peak, uh, and, uh, and instead of having, you know, maybe a very polluting uh, power plants, providing um, electricity, or maybe they don't even have this extra capacity, they could ask uh, cars or buildings uh, to um, fill this gap and provide electricity to the grid, which is very disruptive again. So this is why it's quite, quite interesting. Um, now, if you go to the business model part, which was uh, the additional question, um, I, I just would like to throw additional question to our participants. Um, to help them maybe uh, uh, think about that. Um, today, if you charge your, your, your car in Dubai uh, with, uh, with a charging station, uh, the price is very minimal. I think you are going to pay like uh, 20 fields, with, uh, 20, uh, sorry, ID, which is very, I mean, small money. Uh, in the US, you have areas uh, where this is for free. Um, and this is really a question that we have to ask ourselves. Um, uh, do we have, I mean, can it stay for free, for instance? If it stay for free, is it going to help the industry uh, to expand? Uh, I'm not really sure of that. Um, at the same time, how do you make it attractive for everybody? And, and this is a bit uh, what I was trying to explain with the, the Rotterdam case study, where um, the municipality uh, is not having a huge financial burden in buying the assets, for instance. Uh, instead, they lease uh, the location where those assets are put um, and the company that is putting in place those assets, they are finding a way to make money on it by being authorized to sell 
electricity or to sell time of use. So I'm going to sell you minutes. Uh, maybe it takes you 20 minutes to recharge your car, so I'm going to sell you 20 minutes. Or in some markets, it's authorized to sell electricity, so I will sell you kilowatt hours. Uh, and in that regard, you can find a balance between the municipality fulfilling its goal of you know, making a smart city, of, of maybe as well regulatory uh, obligation that they have, and uh, the provider uh, being able to um, monetize uh, the infrastructure that they are putting in place. Um, so today, I think they are not uh, like a, a perfect business model or, or, or the magic formula to make it work. I think it's a lot of uh, uh, trials and, and failure and, and testing stuff. And, and this is what I think is very important for Dubai, because Dubai has always been a laboratory to experiment. Uh, they are recognized as such. Um, so I think it's their time if they want to show that they are the, the smartest city or or that they are a bit ahead of the curve to allow those tests and trials, and they are doing it. So you can see that they are evolving towards it. So in other words, uh, I, I guess the question for everybody is, um, is there a business model that fits them all? Or you know, are we going to have localized business models agreeable to everybody? But what is clear here, I think, from what we've heard today from all of you, is that the one thing is clear is the amount of people buying and selling electricity is going to go up, whatever happens. And when this happens, the whole infrastructure, the whole the way that the, 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 the marketplace, in this case is the grid, works changes completely. And how this sits together into a business model, we still don't know. Uh, we need to test it and see, but what is for sure is that it's changing. So we need to as such try and um, adapt to the opportunity and um, to as much as possible um, move our business in this direction. I'd like to thank you very much, both, and you know, also Colin that is left, but Stefan, thank you very much for your time. I think it's been really interesting. I hope that our audience also enjoyed it. And uh, we hope in the future to keep bringing together with the Clean Energy Business Council uh, more informative events such as this. Uh, thank you very much for your time. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.